Okay, hi everyone. So we talked about sub-GV dark sectors yesterday, motivating them, why they might be interesting to look at. And what I want to do today is discuss how we can look for them. And we wrote down a very simple dark sector yesterday, just with a dark photon and some dark matter in it. And today we're gonna try and see how we can look for the simplest thing, just the dark photon itself, how we can produce it and how it would show up in a detector. And then we're gonna add dark matter to it. In particular, we're gonna allow the dark, the dark photon to decay to dark matter. And we're gonna see what kind of search strategies exist or we, that we can think about. And again, one can imagine more complicated models easily, right? We don't know what the dark sector, we don't know if it exists, we don't know what it consists of if it does exist. So there's various possibilities, but the types of experiments I'll talk about today uh, will give you some toolbox, so to speak, to look for similar signals. Um, and they're not, you know, I'll talk, well, I'll mention LHC very briefly, LHC searches, but the focus will be on different things. So today, the accelerated base probes for A-prime and sub-GV dark matter. One thing that'll be important a little bit is the decay length of the dark photon. I've written it here again. So it's about 0.1 centimeter for an epsilon of 10 to minus 5 and a dark photon mass of a GV. And remember, this one of an effective is basically the number of particles in decay to in the standard model. So one if it's below the muon threshold and more if it's above the muon threshold. And these are the possible decay modes, also hadrons, and that's the basic interaction of the dark photon to charged particles. So any charged particle can produce, in principle, a dark photon. So we're gonna focus on producing the dark photon. So we're gonna focus on the mass range above two, twice the electron mass. That's where this formula holds. And basically, if you can create a photon, you can also create a dark photon. And that's sort of a, the, the basic theme. So however we can produce a photon in various interactions, we can imagine producing a dark photon as well, and then we can look for it in particular ways. So one very simple way is that we go to an electron positron collider. So LEP is an example, as are Baba and Bell, which are the B factories, and Bell II coming up in the next few years. So, and also Chloe, uh, which uh, the Daphne, uh, Daphne in, in, in Italy, which, can, which is also an E plus E minus collider. And the idea is that you collide an electron positron pair in a ring, um, and then you see what comes out. And many of these experiments, like Baba or Bell, they sit on a particular resonance, like we talked about yesterday in the discussion session. They sit, for example, at 10.5 GeV on the opson resonance, and then they produce a lot of B mesons like that. But what we can look at them here is we can imagine that they can produce a dark photon. So you have a process where you can produce two photons, and I can replace one photon with a dark photon, and then I get this. The cross-section for this process scales as follows, so 2 pi epsilon squared. There has to be an epsilon squared because there's an epsilon here in the cross-section, we square it. And then we have some alphas. And the important thing is that it goes as one over the center of mass energy squared. So the higher energy beams you're using, the lower the cross-section. And there's some kinematic factor. Of course, you can only produce the dark photon if its mass is less than the center mass energy squared. So that's this factor. And then also what can happen is that you might have the photon collinear with the incoming electron or positron, in which case you get a singularity. That singularity is cut off, in effect, by the size of the detector. So you don't have detectors right in the beam line, of course. You have it slightly off the beam line, and that will then give you some, um, uh, some cutoff. So there's some log, which I'm not going to specify, but that, that's what the log is. That's a multiplication. Okay. Uh, good. So now, what you can see, basically, is that the cross-section is one of our center mass energy squared. And if you ask how sensitive are different experiments to this kind of signal, what you want is a low energy collider with a lot of data, so high luminosity. So the sensitivity will be proportional to the luminosity, the integrated luminosity over the center of mass energy squared. So there are various colliders, as I was mentioning, and we can just make a little table. So 
So the center mass energy in GeV, the integrated luminosity of these different colliders in uh, inverse femtobahn. And we have, for example, Chloe or Daphne sitting at 1 GeV with an integral luminosity of 2.5 in the femtobahn. There's a Chloe 2 coming online. I forget exactly when, actually, but that's going to have a factor of 10 more luminosity. There's Baba and Bell. with about 10 GV center of mass energy and an integrated luminosity of together about 1,400. So that's a lot. And then LEP has a center of mass energy. So they sat on the Z pole for a while, 91 GV, and then they scan between 189 to 209 GV with an integrated luminosity of 0.5 and 2.6 inverse femtobahn. And then upcoming is Bell 2, again with 10 GeV. These are upgrades to Bell, basically. And they're going to have an integrated luminosity of about 50 inverse atobahn, or 50,000 inverse femtobahn. And the cross section, just to convert this to a cross section, so this is about 2.4 femtobahn. for an epsilon of 10 to the minus 3. And 10.58 uh, center of mass energy. So normalized to the B factories times the log. <clears throat> OK, so what you can do is just to see the number of events that you're producing is just multiply the integrated velocity with a cross section. And you can see that at Babao Bell, just in this process, for this particular epsilon, you would get you know, several, almost 10,000 events, roughly, right? A little bit less. Okay. So this is really a large signal that you can look for. So this search has been done at Baba. The analysis has been done. And um, there's limits on that. And I'll try to sketch them by hand in a, in a, in a few minutes. Okay. And of course, Bell 2 will, will look for this. And of course, you, haven't, you would have heard about it if something has been seen, but it hasn't. Yes? Is it more inclined to back to B plus Good. So what you're looking for is this decay. So the dark photon will decay to, depending on its mass, to addition positive pairs, mu plus your minus, and other things. So what do you do? How do you look for that? The way you look for that is you've got some background spectrum. You take the very mass of your electron positron pair coming out. There's some background spectrum just from QED. I'm just drawing it roughly. Um, and then there's some resonance sitting at the dark photon mass. And this is a number of events. And this width of the dark photon is tiny. OK, so uh, yesterday we wrote down the width. It's, it's, it's very small. So what determines the width in the experiment is just the detector resolution. OK, but just because you cannot measure perfectly the energy and the momentum of the particles. So that determines the width. And for Baba, it's roughly MeV-ish. Okay. Or 10-ish MeV, but, but, but worse, yeah. For invisible decays? Right. Yes. We will get to that in a few minutes. Yeah. We we'll look at dark decays to dark matter. So LEP, right, has a center of mass energy, just to give you that example first, about 100 GeV. So you see that in the cross-section, you're down by uh, two orders of magnitude compared to Baba, just the cross-section itself. And that luminosity was also small. So ILC or, or you know, FCCE will, of course, have larger luminosities. But because of the cross-section, you, know, you, you want to use Bell, um, Bell 2. Unless, of course, the dark photon is above 10 GV, and then you can't produce it here. In that case, you, you have to look at the other, other things, yeah. OK. So then the second thing is uh, beam dumps, or fixed target experiments. And there's two types that we'll talk about. It's an electron and a proton.
No. Uh, LEP has a factor of 100 times more energy. Yeah. So in the cross section, the sensitivity goes as one of a uh, you know, factor of 100 squared versus one of a 10 squared. Oh, nice. Right, and the luminosity is, is also less. Nice. Yeah, so there's a significant difference, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, so another type of experiment you can do, uh, which sounds cool, you take an electron, you shoot it onto a target, and you see what comes out. So there's various ways you can set that up. But here's the basic setup. You've got an electron beam coming in. There's a target. The thickness of the target can vary. You can make a very thin target, which you want to do if the dark photon lifetime is very short, because then you don't want to have the dark photon decay inside the target. Because once it decays inside the target, the electron positrons coming out, they'll multiple scatter. That's going to mess up your angular resolution if you want to look for an invariant mass peak. Uh, or you can just use a thick target if you look for very long lifetime um, dark photons. And the idea is that you produce the dark photon here. The diagram is the following. So you've got some target nucleus, like tungsten or tantalum, some or carbon, whatever you want to use. There's an interaction here, which is E times Z. So the, dark pho the photon couples to the charge, so it's Z times the number of electrons. Um, and then there's a photon and dark photon being produced, radiated like that. Okay, so this is some nucleus. Okay. And the cross-section um, will scale as z squared times alpha cubed epsilon squared over ma prime squared. And again, there's some log pieces which come from various singularities, which I'm not going to discuss in detail. So that's the cross section. And we can vary, as I said, the thickness of the target. Um, we usually measure the thickness of the target in terms of radiation lengths. So a radiation length is the distance over which a high energy electron will lose all of its energy except for one of a E, so about all of its energy except you know, 37%. Um, and for one radiation length, the number of dark photons you would produce is the following. And I'm going to normalize this to a Coulomb of incoming electrons. So a Coulomb of incoming electrons is how much? A bit, bit less than 10 to the 19, so 6 times 10 to the 18, or something like that. OK. So that's a lot of electrons coming in. Um, normalized to this, we get about 10 to the 8 dark photons being produced for an epsilon of 10 to the minus 3 squared and for 100 MeV. So <clears throat> that's quite a lot of dark photons. And uh, you could imagine that that's, well, so the cross section is naively, naively larger, or is larger than um, an E plus or minus collider. Um, the way these dark photons are produced is that they are produced very forward. So they have a large boost from the incoming electron. The dark photons carry most of the beam energy. So it's not like photon radiation, where you radiate a massless photon where it tends to like, it likes to carry you know, not, not that much energy, but the dark photon will carry most of the beam energy. And then it decays to E plus E minus pair. And the opening angle of the E plus E minus pair is as follows. So A prime produced very forward. The angle with respect to the incoming electron goes as the dark photon mass over the beam energy. 
to the power of 3 over 2. And the opening angle to e plus e minus, for example, is also very large. It goes as the dark photon mass of the beam energy. <clears throat> and then what you do is, well, what you do depends exactly what you're looking for. So you can have a target that's very thin if you want to look for prompt decay. So you can have a very thick target with some shielding behind it to avoid any backgrounds and then look for very long-lived dark photons. So there's various options. And all these various experiments uh, exist, or, um, yeah, and all these various ideas exist. So for prompt decays, you want to look for an electron coming in, being produced in the target, and then basically immediately decaying, at least not, uh, you can't resolve it, to an electron positron pair, for example. And then you put a spectrometer here and a spectrometer there, and you choose the angles of the spectrometer opening angle to be what you need it to be to probe certain masses and given the sun beam energy. So you can tune the angles in principle, um, and, or you can change the beam energy to probe different particular masses of the dark photon. So you've got some two-arm spectrometer and examples of this are uh, the Apex experiment and an experiment that was done at Mainz. So Apex is at JLab. Uh, Apex stands for A prime experiment. And um, yeah, and Mainz did something very similar. Um, and this is looking for prompt dark photons. So there's a huge amount of background that you also get. Right? So you might think, oh, I'm producing so many dark photons. This is going to be a very easy search. And what you want to do is you want to look for some resonance of the E plus E minus pay. So you want to measure the momenta and energies very precisely. The problem is that there's a lot of backgrounds as well. So there's, for example, diagrams like this, where this is the nucleus. Here's the electron coming in. There's a photon. I'm rating a photon, an off-shell photon that goes to E plus E minus. So that's one particular background. That's actually an irreducible background. So we take, if the photon has precisely the if the momentum squared of the photon is precisely the mass squared of the dark photon, then that's irreducible. Uh, you can't distinguish it. Another diagram that gives a background, which is much larger, but it, um, it looks kinematically very different, so you can get rid of most of it, is this one, where you have photons radiating like that. So th all those different backgrounds give you two electrons and a positron, just like the signal, and you have to contend with that. But what you basically get is a big um, big spectrum of events, and you look for an invariant mass, and you do a bump punch just like you do for the, the dark photon, uh, for, for the bar bar search. Okay. <coughs> well. You mean uh, here? Yeah. That's right, but then there's going to be two insertions of epsilon. There's two epsilons, right? So that's going to be suppressed. You're right, yeah. And there's also interference between these two, which is, which is important. OK. OK, let me see if I can figure this out. Say that again. Oh, good. So the target, what you want to use is a very thin target. And where, to answer your question, depends how thick the target is and what the lifetime is. So different epsilons, for some epsilons, going to decay inside the target. For other epsilons, going to decay outside the target. If it's inside the target, there's some multiple scattering as it goes out, which degrades your mass resolution. But it can do either, depending on epsilon. And for tungsten, for example, the, um, the radiation length is 3.5 millimeters. So you don't need a very thick target. For example, if you use tungsten, the radiation length is 3.5 millimeters. Maybe you take 10% radiation length target. So it's a very thin target, 0.35 millimeters. So um, the chance that it decays outside you know, is pretty, pretty large. But you have to take that into account. So it depends on epsilon. Oh, 
Oh, by prompt, I just mean you can't resolve a vertex, right? So it decays within a fraction of a millimeter. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can't resolve it. And by displace, which I'll talk about next, by that I mean you can resolve a decay vertex. So it actually lives for a centimeter or something, and you can distinguish that from that, uh, and you don't, when you see where the electron positron pairs come from, they don't come from the target, they actually come from behind the target in, in empty space, and there's just an E plus E minus pair that appears. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Okay, so even though the cross-section is very large in these experiments, you're producing a ton of dark photons, uh, they don't all, uh, they won't, they don't all uh, go into your detector. So if you have a two-arm spectrometer, then you're not sensitive to the stuff that doesn't go into your spectrometer. So if it's very forward, then you don't see it. Or it's a wider angle, you don't see it. So you want to tune your spectrometers in such a way that you maximize the signal, and, you know, and then you see whatever background comes in as well. But for example, for Apex, the acceptance is tiny. It's less than 0.1%. So we lose a huge amount of dark photons that are actually getting produced, and uh, we only see 0.1% you know, of them. So even though the production is large, there's also a big loss just from the acceptance. So. I should also say that, so Apex had a test run in 2010, so there's a, little, there's a result from that, and the scheduling suggests that Apex could run you know, next year at JLab, but you know, there's no official schedule yet. We're, we're, there's no schedule yet where, where Apex is on the schedule at JLab, so we have to see. And Mines already has a result, and as far as I know, they're not planning to do any further runs, um, but they have a very nice result already that they had a few years ago. So just, So there's old experiments that did beam dumps or so, or with thicker targets. And I'll talk about that in a second, yeah. Okay, so displaced vertices. So here what I'm talking about is decay lengths that are order a few centimeters, or order a centimeter. And if you wanna know that you have a displaced vertex, you need to be able to track your electrons and positrons as they come out so that you can track them back from the origin and see if, the, if they originate from a point that isn't, doesn't coincide with the target. That's a great way to reject background because the background shouldn't do that. Uh, of course, you can still get fake displaced vertices just from multiple scattering, et cetera, but it's a great, in principle, it's a great way to get rid of background. So one experiment that does this is HPS, where you have an electron beam on a target and the dark photon gets produced and then there's a decay C plus E minus and you've got silicon layers here to track the electron and then you know, find, track back where, to see where the origin is. Um, HPS has taken some data and they're hoping for a much longer run, or you know, 180 days or so over the next uh, year or two at JLab as well. So there's a tracker. <clears throat> and you know, one fun little thing about HPS. So there's a tiny gap here that I drew. Uh, there's a gap of about 0.5 millimeters. So they're 0.5 millimeters away from the beam line. Um, there's a huge amount of charge, electrons, that go straight through the target and you know, to, to some dump um, afterwards. And you have to make sure that you don't put those silicon tracking elements inside the beam because otherwise you, your thing is dead, your experiment is dead but they get within 0.5 millimeters of that beam line. So it's, it's a really cool engineering feat. Okay, so, and there's reduced background because you've displaced vertex, vertex. And because you're sensitive to this, 
this experiment HPS will probe slightly smaller epsilon than, for example, Apex or Mines. Okay, and then finally, uh, among the beam dumps, so this is long lived, and by which it could be anything longer than this, so bigger than 10 centimeter to, you know, whatever you want, kilometers, or a kilometer or a few hundred meters. And one example of this is E137, which was a beam dump experiment that was run at SLAC in the 1980s, looking for axions, I think, at the time. And James Bjorken was one of the people on the experiment. <clears throat> and it was at SLAC. There's an electron beam on a target. Then there's a big hill. I think there was some open region. And then there's a detector behind it. And this distance was about 400 meters. <clears throat> and the idea is that you produce the dark photon, and it goes all the way through to the detector, and then it decays to E plus E minus inside the detector. Okay, so it has to be long lived to do that. And uh, there's a constraint from this, and the, what it rules out basically is very low epsilon so that you can actually live for order 100 meters to make it to the detector. But for epsilons larger, so if epsilons get large and the decay length becomes shorter, and then E137 doesn't probe that anymore. So it's sort of, there's a certain region that it probes. So what is the target material? What's the target material? Yeah. I think it was um, beryllium, but it doesn't matter. Just, just it, the whole beam gets dumped and can scatter whatever there is. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know. So then you just, you don't see anything. Sure, that can happen. <clears throat> but there's some chance that it decays inside the detector. So you can calculate what that is. So there's a band, right. So the constraint will look like this. I'll draw this again in a second. It looks something like this. So for very low epsilon, you don't produce enough. Uh, epsilon needs to be large enough so that you produce enough. So then there's a constraint. If you make epsilon too large, then the decay length becomes uh, too fast, and then the constraint disappears. And the slope of this is basically given by, not by C tau, but by gamma C tau, the decay length in the, in the frame of the Earth. Okay. So there's some boost factor that you get. The beam was uh, ordered 20 GV, if I remember correctly. And um, <clears throat> so you get a boost factor of you know, 100 MeV if the dark photon mass is 100 MeV. Um, one, so 20 GV over 100 MeV, for example. So a factor of 20 boost factor. So yeah. the hill is the shield the detector? Yeah, so the hill just basically gets rid of all other things that might arise. I mean, you might have some background of things that get through, but um, very unlikely. Oh, this, that's just the way the setup was. Yeah, there's another hill here. I think there was another hill, yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if the reasoning was that sophisticated. I mean, yeah, so, so I think it was just that, I think it was more like, where can we put the detectors to shield it a little bit? Uh, a big part of the background was actually electrons going up or charged particles going up, hitting gas in the atmosphere, I mean, uh, the, the ox uh, air in the atmosphere, and then coming back down. So it was so-called sky shine. That was a lot of the background. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think it was more of a, there's no reason you need this open space. I've, like, usually you can just put a, you can have a mountain and put a detector, you know, in it. Okay, good. Okay, then, so we did E plus E minus colliders, fixed target of beam dumps, and now we'll talk about meson decays very briefly. So mesons decay, meson decays will often involve a photon, in which case you can just replace it with a dark photon, as we said. So one example of this is pi zero going to gamma A prime, 
So you can have, uh, so by zero usually goes to gamma gamma most of the time, but you can have a small mixing with the photon, with the dark photon, and then you can have this decay. And the decay rate for pi zero to gamma A prime is very simply related to pi zero going to gamma gamma by, so there's an epsilon, and then there's a symmetry factor of two because you don't have two, the, the final state, you, you can have, it could be either photon that goes to the dark photon, so you get a factor of two, and then there's a one minus ma prime squared over m pi squared. And there's other decays that you can consider, like phi goes to eta a prime, et cetera, okay? So wherever you have a facility where you produce a lot of pions, then this is a possible way to get dark photons as well. And there are various possibilities of how you might get uh, mesons, or I mean pions or other mesons in general. And there was even analysis done by Rick, the relativistic heavy ion collider with the Phoenix experiment where they have, they looked at the, you know, proton-proton collision that they had, and I don't know if they've done the, the heavy ion collisions yet if they looked at that, but they produce a ton of pions and they can do a search for this particular decay. And again, the dark photon decays to E plus E minus, and then they can look for a resonance of the E plus E minus, okay. But another way you can produce, get a lot of pions is from proton beams, proton beam dumps. <clears throat> so which experiments use a proton beam dump? What do you say, LHC? Beam dump, beam dump. Not proton proton collisions. L S and D, yeah. Okay, and that's an old thing. Micro boon, mini boon, any neutrino facility, they have a proton beam, they produce, they hit the proton beam on a target. Uh, when the proton hit, interacts with the target, you produce all kinds of stuff, including pions. The pions will decay, you produce, for example, pi plus or pi minuses. Those will decay to muons and neutri muon neutrinos. The muons decay to give you muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos. And what you then get is a neutrino beam. And that's what they then use to put a detector behind it where they look for neutrino scattering, okay? But you can use that facility to also look for dark photons. So in particular, you can produce a pi zero or another meson, but uh, there's lots of pi zeros. And then the pi zero can go to gamma A prime. So basically you would get a dark photon beam. And then again, depending on where the detector sits, you can put a detector behind it. And look for the dark photon decaying inside your detector. <clears throat> so <clears throat> indeed, there's many possibilities. So LS and D. There's mini boon. And I think I got the capital letters correct. Um, at least a 50% chance. Okay, and then there's ship. And there's sequest. There's T2K, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so all these, in principle, can do a search. LS and D <clears throat> had about 10 to the 23 protons on target. You produce about 0.1 to 1 pion per proton on target. So you get a lot of pions. Okay, so pions are a common occurrence. So the number of pions is about 0.1 to 1 times the number of protons on target. No, it's a new proposal. Yeah. <clears throat> At Fermilab. 
Okay, so very briefly, some LAC signatures. So I'm going to be super brief here. I think I'm on number five. So because the dark photon mixes really with hypercharge, there's a coupling with the Z as well. So the Higgs can, of course, decay to, through, through the ZZ star in the standard model. But because of the mixing, you can also get a, take, a decay like this, Higgs to Z A prime. And uh, you can do a search. It's not the most amazing probe, not the most amazing sensitivity at the moment, but it is something that exists and you can in principle look for. And also allows you to access higher mass dark photons than Babao Bell, which you know, stop at 10 GV or so. So you can do this search. Another LHC search, so this is that LHC. Another LHC search is that you can use Jal Yan production. So you produce lepton pairs through the Z and the photon. So proton, proton collides to give you, you know, gamma star or Z star that goes to leptons. And you can also have an A prime, which decays then to L plus L minus or pi plus pi minus. And you can look for a resonance in the, in the Jalian spectrum. So that's at that C as well. And Um, no, you can actually produce, yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, you look for resonance, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Thanks. And uh, you can also do at LHCB. LHCB is great at looking for, uh, at tracking charged particles, and you can look for displaced vertices very well. So, and you produce, of course, a ton of mesons when you collide protons. So there's various possible decays you can look at, and something that's been pointed out in the literature is decays of the D star meson, D0 star meson, going to D0 dark photons, where this then decays to E plus E minus. And there's a huge rate where, at which you produce the D mesons, and you can do a, a very good search for this. So if you want to know more about these various things, you know, there's references in the Cosmic Visions white paper that I gave at the beginning. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So, and then one other thing I'll just mention. This may have been mentioned last week already briefly. Lepton jets. So you can imagine that the dark photon is at, uh, that you produce a dark photon at the LHC in some particular way. And because it gets a large, large boost, then in the case of leptons, you produce a very collimated pair of leptons. Now, the way you produce these dark photons, there's various possibilities. So one thing that people imagined, so Nima and Neil in 2008, with all the, when all these cosmic ray anomalies were around, and they talked about the sub -GB dark sectors, that one possibility is that you have some supersymmetric event. You produce gluinos or something. They decay down to the lightest supersymmetric particle, which is ordinarily stable. But if you've got this kinetic mixing interaction, there's a light dark sector that it can actually decay to. So then you've got some very boosted particles that include the dark photon at the end, and they decay to lepton pairs. And what you have is lepton jets, because the very mass of these lepton jets is of order GV, because it's a GV scale dark sector, and uh, they're very collimated. So they look like jets, just with a lot of lepton content in them. And there's a whole bunch of searches going on at the LHC, uh, and also at the Tevatron in the past. Okay, and then, so those are the way we, we can produce it. Yesterday, very, we talked about this in the discussion session about indirect effects. So there's various kinds of indirect effects for dark photons that you might worry about or that, that you might be excited about. And one of them was the G minus two, where the dark photon can give you contribution for either for electron or the muon G minus two. And that contribution for one of these, for electrons and muons, goes as alpha over two pi. So this we wrote down yesterday already, but I'll do it again because it wasn't part of the lecture yesterday. And there's two limits where the dark photon is either much lighter than the lepton, then it's just a simple factor. So that's just the normal photon contribution in the loop. There's an epsilon squared if you've got a dark photon. 
but if the dark photon mass is heavier than the lepton, then the scaling is a bit different. It's given by this here. Okay, and this is possibly exciting for the muon because you get a contribution to the muon anomalous magnetic moment, which brings it in agreement, which brings the theory calculation with the dark photon in agreement with the measurement. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to attempt to draw the plane, epsilon ma prime plane. So what you can see is just this, you know, simple model has so many different searches, so many different analyses that could be done, different experiments that could be done. And um, since it's such a simple portal, you know, principle, a very important portal because it could, the epsilon could be very large, it could be a very important connection to a dark sector if it's something like this exists. You know, it's the people have spent a lot of attempt, have spent a lot of time trying to probe the different masses. So up to about 10 to the 3 GV, so TV, okay. So we're starting at MEV, so 2 ME, 10 MEV, 100 GV. 10 GV, 100, and a TV. And epsilons here. Let's start from 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 8, and 10 to minus 10. So at the low mass end, at high epsilon, the G minus twos rule out things. So there's a, the band, first of all, that you, where you can explain the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon that lies around here. So, so there's a little preferred band. If you lie along this band, you can explain the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Then there's constraints from the G minus two of the electron, which disfavor this whole thing. This is the preferred. <clears throat> then there's a, the beam dump searches, like E137 that we talked about, and also others. They rule out the low epsilon piece. Yeah, all this is assuming that it decays to visible. Yep, yep, to standard model. There's nothing lighter, no lighter state, except the standard model. That's right. Yeah. I'll comment on that in a second. Yeah. Again, okay, then there's supernova constraints. However, they look at the bottom here, which rule out things. <clears throat> so we didn't talk about supernova, but supernovas, you can produce this. There could be an anomalous, anomalous cooling of the supernova that can carry away energy. And then up here, there's Baba, which covers things up to 10 GV. And there's proposed fixed target experiments like APEX and HPS, where we can cover this region. So a new fixed target. So this region is open in the middle here. And there's new fixed target experiments, uh, LHCb, the thing that I was mentioning, number seven. And also, uh, yeah, also HPS, for example. HPS, because it's sensitive to displaced vertices, can probe slightly smaller epsilon, but not as small as the beam dump searches down here. Okay, so this is sort of a rough cartoon. And then once you get above 10 GV, there is LHC searches, which are weaker. 
Um, and there's some future searches from Zhao Yan at a future you know, proton proton collider, 100 TV collider or so, which can make some impact. You know, we can probe this. Sorry, let me make this solid and make dashed everything that hasn't been done. There's various proposals here. I haven't talked about all of them, but that's the region you can cover. <clears throat> okay. And then below an MEV, things change drastically because the lifetime is long, like we talked about. There's stellar constraints. And then you go lower, then there's you know, open parameter space again, but there's a whole bunch of, of experiments. But you can see just a simple model already does a lot. Okay. <clears throat> and you're right, so G minus 2 doesn't assume anything about how it decays. So it's ruled out for the visible decay. I didn't draw this very well. This whole thing is covered, I should say, okay, just to be clear. <clears throat> this whole thing is dead. And, um, but in principle, it can decay other ways. Okay. But the invisible decay that we'll talk about next, that's also ruled out. So it could decay in some more complicated way, like to four leptons or something. That has not been probed. So that's still allowed. Yeah, it might not be a good sensitivity, and you might, so I don't know what, exactly what the sensitivity will be. I suspect it won't be that good, but yeah. It's worth thinking about for five minutes, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the visible decays. Now let's imagine that we add the dark matter to it. And we have a new decay, so the dark photon can decay to dark matter. So we've got subgb dark matter. And what can you do then to look for that? And what you'll see is that the searches that I'll go through are similar. Not all the same, but they're similar. Similar types of experiments. So again, beam dumps and colliders, and we see what kind, we'll see what kind of signals you can get. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go to subgb dark matter. Right, so the basic idea is that now you have a new decay channel where this is allowed. The decay rate for that goes as alpha dark. And very simply, you can make this much larger than this decay rate, which goes as alpha epsilon squared. So if alpha dark is larger than alpha epsilon squared, you know, this will dominate and you'll have an invisible, so to speak, decay. Okay. Invisible just means that the dark matter will not leave, deposit any energy in your detector, like a charged particle might. <clears throat> okay. So this dominates. So then as I think Hari already pointed out. So one thing you can do in the E plus E minus collider is that you can look for missing momentum or missing energy. And since you know the initial state, electron positrons energy is coming in, and you can measure the outgoing photon, you can, in principle, do a very good measurement. So you've got electron positron coming in, producing a photon, producing a dark photon that then decays to chi, chi bar. So what you have is gamma plus nothing. <clears throat> so as before, you're producing this on shell, so the sensitivity of a particular experiment will scale as the luminosity over the center of mass energy squared. So that's the same. But now what you want to look for is for missing mass. And it's very simple to calculate the kinematics for this process if you produce an on shell dark photon that is uh, that, you know, that you don't see. So what you can do is you can measure, so what you measure, of course, is photons plus the missing energy. And you can measure the photons and they'll have a particular energy. So you can measure E gamma and you can plot mx squared 
which is S, so that's the center of mass energy squared, oh, time, minus two times E gamma, times root S. And when you plot that particular quantity, so there's going to be a lot of background events, of course, but when you plot that particular quantity, what you want to see is a little bump where the dark photon mass is. Okay. So again, there'll be some background, and what you do is you can look for a bump on, on top of this. So you look for a missing mass peak. And Baba has done the search uh, pretty recently with their full data set, and they set a very nice constraint, and that constraint basically rules out the anomalous magnetic moment, the dark photon explanation for the anomalous magnetic moment for invisible decays. So it's roughly 10 to minus 3 um, at low masses of, for epsilon, the constraint in epsilon for this particular model. So even if the dark photon decays to light dark matter, you know, it's not a viable explanation for uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. But again, other possible decays are you know, in principle possible. Other, other decays are in principle possible. So constraints from Baba. <clears throat> 2017, a few months ago. And then, of course, there's lots of future searches. So as part of this white paper that we put out uh, a week ago or so, there's a whole bunch of possibilities to look for this signal, to look for light dark matter. So of course, you can just do the same thing at Bell 2. Um, I should just, yeah, I should say, this is not as simple as I'm making it out to be, right? What you need to do is you need to look for a photon. So depend and the mass, the resolution of this mass peak depends on the photon. And also there is background, especially at low energies, what you can get is that you have an electron-positron pair going to two photons, and the detector has cracks, or you know, it's not totally hermetic, and what you can get is um, a missing photon, a uh, signal faking a missing photon, just a standard model background. And uh, that, that can be, uh, that's a big background, okay, that you have to worry about. And also, there's a huge rate for these particular events, so your data acquisition system has to handle that. There needs to be a special trigger put in by Bell to, to you know, do the search. Okay. By the way, and I don't know if I misspoke earlier. So Baba didn't have this trigger for the full data set. They only had it for a fraction of the data set. So they reanalyzed that fraction of the data set, roughly 30 to 50 in this femtobahn, and they just did an analysis on that but they didn't have the trigger for the full data set, so you couldn't even use the full you know, 500 in this femtobahn or so that they had. Okay, so Bell 2, there is um, experiments that are similar in spirit here, but they're actually sort of beam dump experiments. What you can do is you can take a positron beam and shoot it onto a target and have the positron interact with the electrons in the target. And then you also get E plus E minus collisions. But what you're actually using is a positron beam. There's a positron beam and target. The reaction is exactly the same. And um, there's various targets that people talk about, but there's had me, since you might hear about these experiments in the future, I'm just gonna list them, MMAPS. So PADME is in Italy, MMAPS is in Cornell. VEP3 is a proposed experiment in Russia. And they're, all, they're all using a positron beam on different targets, so either diamond target, beryllium, or a hydrogen gas target. And there's also, yeah, okay. So those are the positron beam experiments. Okay, then going to the fixed target experiments, 
there is uh, some very nice, very interesting ideas as well. Okay, so there's a one there, yeah, good. There's my two. So missing, we look for missing momentum or missing energy in a beam dump experiment. So the missing energy was, as far as I know, first proposed by Knenenko in 2013, and then there was a group with, that included him uh, who proposed an experiment at CERN looking for missing uh, momentum, missing energy. And then uh, Ed Ezegiri, Gordon Krinjayek, Philip Schuster, and Natalia Toro also proposed to look for missing momentum and uh, proposed you know, um, experiments like that as well. And the following idea, the following is the idea. So you've got an electron beam on a target again. So it's a fixed target experiment. You again produce the dark photon. Now we're going to keep track of the recoiling electron, though. And then this dark photon, in the case of dark matter. And what you have is you want to look for the missing momentum or missing energy that you get from this beam. So what you need to do is you need to know your incoming beam energy or you know, keep track of the incoming electron. You need to keep track of the outgoing electron and see if there's missing energy or missing momentum. So you can either put a calorimeter right there to mis measure the energy of the event, or you can put some um, you know, silicon tracking elements to measure the momentum very precisely of the outgoing electron and try to see if there's missing momentum. <clears throat> so recall that you know, the A prime carries most of the beam energy. So this is a large signal as such. And otherwise, the cross-section is exactly the same. So the diagram that which you're producing this with, there's a nucleus, there's an electron, and you're radiating the dark photon, which then decays to dark matter. OK. <clears throat> so the number of events that you get here is just proportional to epsilon squared. So the number of missing energy events will be proportional to epsilon squared. as opposed to some other things that I'll talk about in a minute, where there's also an alpha dark that comes in. And I'll, I'll, the, I'll, this is the next thing I'll talk about. But this is a sort of a very um, you know, simple idea, and it's a, it can really probe things, uh, orders of magnitude, of, it can order, probe orders of magnitude of new parameter space. So there's a new experiment that's proposed by people at Slack, and they, it's called LDMX, Light Dark Matter Experiment and it can really probe a lot of new parameter space that hasn't been covered in this particular uh, channel. Okay. And I'll show the projections for that in the last lecture and what kind of experiment, what kind of models it can, it can cover. So one search that was already done was NA64. So there's a result from them and there's also more data coming. And the other one is LDMX. Okay. <clears throat> Say again. Oh, uh, oh, that's a good question. So, I don't know what NA stands for. Maybe someone else does. Yeah. Hmm? North area. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Yeah, so some people give their name, give their experiments real names. So E137 never got a real name. It's just E137. There's other beam dump experiments that appear on there. Uh, you know, anyway, they also have some E, e name to it uh, on the plot. But uh, so this, this has a real name. <clears throat> OK, uh, good. Yeah, let me give you some other examples, okay? And then ask your question again if I didn't give you more examples. Okay, I think I will give you more examples, okay. Okay, so instead of looking for missing energy or momentum, 
What you can also do is, well, something very similar, but now what you're gonna try and do is you're gonna try and detect the dark matter in your detector again. So what you have is this electron beam coming in, a target, you produce the dark photon, it decays to dark matter. So again, you know, the decay products are very forward. So now you've got a relativistic dark matter beam going down your beam pipe. And then you put a detector behind it uh, that can be shielding there, like an E137, for example. You can put some shielding. There, there's, a, there's a hill in the way, partially. And then the dark matter comes in and hits an electron inside this, or a nucleus, and gives a recording electron or a recording nucleus. And then what you see is the recording electron or recording nucleus. Okay. So you produce the dark matter through the dark photon decay. There's a relativistic dark matter beam. And then in the detector, the dark matter, since it couples through a dark photon, that's the assumption, right, can just scatter off an electron or a nucleus, and you look for an electron or a recording electron or recording nucleus in the detector. And at E137, that could be done. That, uh, so um, you can reanalyze that data and set a constraint on that. And there's also new proposals for experiments uh, like BDX, beam dump experiment at JLab. So there's a constraint from E137. And proposal for BDX at JLab. Okay. So is that any questions on that? So the number of events that you get here, right, is proportional to epsilon squared. Here you're asking that the dark matter scatters again if you detect her. So the scaling of the number of events that you see, the number of recording electrons or nuclei that you see, will scale differently. And the, so the signal events will scale as epsilon squared. So here you're producing the dark photon. That's the same penalty that you pay here. It's just epsilon squared. Okay, so there's an epsilon in this vertex here. You don't pay any penalty for it decaying. It's just going to decay sometime, however it wants. So it's an order one. Well, we're assuming it's 100% branching ratio to dark matter. So there's no penalty for that. But then we're asking that the dark matter scatters again of electrons. So there's a diagram like this, or of nuclei. We exchange in A prime. And that cross section here scales as an alpha dark. There's a G dark squared here in the cross section. That's an alpha dark. And then there is a epsilon squared in the cross section. So that goes as alpha dark epsilon squared. So the number of events goes as epsilon times alpha dark epsilon squared, which is alpha dark epsilon to the fourth. OK, so there's a suppression compared to the missing momentum. And so in principle, you know, if you have control over all the energy that goes out, you can measure the outgoing energy, the visible energy very precisely, and there's no backgrounds. We can control them. You can do an amazing search here. And here you're sensitive, you know, again, to the dark matter interactions, which teaches you different information, which gives you different information. But the number of events you would expect to see here is less. Okay, yeah? Why do you need an alpha dark for the decay? You don't need an alpha dark for the decay. Or what, oh, you're asking why don't you? Um, I mean, there's a, that determines the decay width. So if alpha dark is very small, it means that the dark photon takes a long time to decay. But as long as the decay is before the detector, you don't care when it decays. So there's no penalty. Because the, what the question is not what the width is. The question is what's the branching ratio. And we assume that the branching ratio of the dark photon to dark matter is 100%. OK, so there's no penalty for that. It's, it's 1. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so you can do something very similar at a proton beam dump. And again, that's our neutrino facilities.
and you can really guess what the signal will be. So you've got a proton coming in onto the target. You produce a meson, like a pi zero, you produce a ton of them. It decays to a dark photon some of the time. So you get a dark photon, and that decays to dark matter. So what you have is a relativistic beam of dark matter particles to your detector. And then the dark matter can again scatter inside the detector of uh, electrons and nuclei. So the, the way it scales is the same as before, alpha dark epsilon to the fourth. Okay. So there's again an epsilon squared in the production because in the decay rate from the pi zero to the dark photon, um, there's an epsilon squared in there. So here it's important because there's the branching ratio. The, the, the branching ratio is actually epsilon squared down. <coughs> so this is a search that had actually been done by Miniboon recently. So Miniboon had a dedicated run to look for the signal. And there's a paper, 1702-02688. Now, the challenge with this particular search is that a neutrino signal does exactly the same thing, right? A neutrino beam that they produce from pi plus and pi minus decays, you get a lot of neutrinos. The neutrinos can come in and also hit electrons and nuclei. That's what they're looking for. And that looks like a dark matter signal. So what they did for this is they actually just shot the beam into um, uh, an absorber, which is where the pions will get stopped, the pi pluses and pi minuses will get stopped very quickly before they decay, and then they decay isotropically instead of very forward, so then the flux of the neutrino background is significantly reduced. There's still some background, but it's significantly reduced than in the standard way that they run the neutrino beam. Um, and then they had a search, which you can look up here, okay. And there's proposals, again, to do this at other facilities. Uh, for example, an experiment called Coherent, which uses the spallation neutron source, which has a huge number of protons on target. And um, there's also a limit that you can get from L uh, Ls and D. So Ls and D has a limit that people reinterpreted. So old Ls and D data. So future coherent at the spallation neutron source and oops, yeah, SPN at Fermilab. Uh, yeah. Like an absorption signal? Right. Um, and you're sensitive any electrons coming out of this material. Are you aware of any So that's used for low energy searches. So, like for, for light dark matter searches, where you've got dark matter that's a dark photon that gets absorbed by an electron and then does what do you say. Right. I think that's what you, what you mean. Um, here, it's. He, so, so, well, sorry. So you don't, you don't want to look for the dark matter. You want to look for the dark photon right. itself. Um, yeah, so the, there's a, yes, so good. So there's a dark photon, which in principle can scatter as well. Um, that actually hasn't been studied as much. So some people have done some preliminary work, uh, including myself on that, but it was never uh, published. Um, that will give you a signal. I don't think it can, it might give you, rule out some new parameter space. It's probably worth looking at, actually. Um, but it's, it doesn't, so a big part of the parameter space, it won't give you anything new that I haven't talked about here. So above an MEV, right, it decays immediately. The decay length, the, the decay rate is too quick. And if you go to super low epsilon so that the decay length is long, the production rate will just be too small, so you don't care. So it's something that only is applicable below an MEV. And for that region, um, there is, there's, there's probably a constraint from some slack mini charge experiment or so, which I can talk, tell you more about, but it was never actually published. But yeah, good, yeah. So for the electrons at PW, usually you usually have this uh, branch run, right? And for the proton, you always go to the pions. But what about the proton beam and you could also have the branch run? 
Yeah, yeah, good, yeah, so good. So I just talked about one particular type of signal. Uh, that's a pretty important signal once, as long as the A prime is below the pion mass and the dark matter is below that. But otherwise, you're absolutely right. You can take you know, this diagram as well and radiate it. Uh, that's, yeah, you can do that as well. <clears throat> so these, these guys at Minibrun, they took all that into account. And there's actually a, um, Patrick de Niverville wrote a whole program, software package that includes all the various production mechanisms, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so I didn't draw it very accurately, so we, we can look at a proper plot. Uh, there's, yeah, th th there's constraints around there. There's also electric precision measurements. So they go down to you know, 10 to minus two-ish, roughly. But if you go below 10 to minus two, there's a, actually a lot of open parameter space. There's some constraints from Jolly Uncertainty at LHC 8 or LHC 7, 7 ATV. <coughs> Yeah, so if you want to know the exact things, you should look at a professionally made plot, not this thing that I drew. Okay. okay. Let's see, three, okay, good. Okay, very good. So we have maybe 10, 15, well, 15 minutes. So that's all I wanted to say about the beam dump stuff, accelerator-based searches. And I'm going to switch to direct detection now. So what I want to do is tell you about direct detection, um, new direct detection techniques for light dark matter. I want to give you a little overview of that. I'll just start it today. I won't get that far, but I just want to set it up and to talk about um, you know, the, the problems with the traditional WIMP searches, why we can't go, to, go below a GV. And then what I'll do at the end of tomorrow's lecture is to look at specific models where we'll try and figure out targets in the simplified model where we can get the right thermal relic abundance in, you know, through the SIMP or the ELDER or, or um, from freeze out or from some initial asymmetry or from freeze in and see how these various experiments that I'll talk about, including the direct detection, uh, can probe these targets. Okay. And that sort of is going to round out the three lectures. So we'll end with your know, models and projections, what we might expect in the next decade. Okay. But before I get to the models and the projections, I'll talk about more generally about subgv direct detection. Okay, any questions on this? Oh, they they triggered on gamma plus nothing. The rest they didn't. They did. They, they just didn't look for monophotons. Yeah. So there's a big background rate for that. Um, which is why it's, you have to build a special trigger for that, and you have to actually want to look for that. And uh, Bell 2, my understanding is that this will be included in Bell 2. So they can do a super sensitive search for this, which, so the beam dump experiments are very good at lower masses, 100 MeV roughly and below. And above that, you can go to Bell 2, and they're going to do very well. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's been a paper on dark photon effects on, on, on isotope shifts, and I'm not qualified to talk about that, but I can give you a reference. Yeah, that has been looked at. At least if you, that's what you're alluding to, the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go top. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, so in general, so we want to probe sub-GB dark matter. Dark detection is a very good way to try and probe it. It's a very important laboratory probe of dark matter in our halo. The idea is that dark matter is all around us, right? In principle, can scatter of atoms of nuclei or other things in our detector and leave some imprint. The dark matter is non-relativistic in the halo, so it travels at a speed of a few hundred kilometers per second. The escape velocity is you know, five, six hundred kilometers per second. So there's a fine amount of energy that the dark matter has and can give you to your, give to your particle. So that's a challenge. 
So we're not talking about relativistic dark matter beams that we could produce at a collider or a beam dump, but we're talking about non-relativistic dark matter particles. But if you see a signal, right, it's a very interesting signal. So as long as you're able to deal with the backgrounds, that's the big challenge in this, in this field, trying to understand all the backgrounds, removing them. If you can deal with them and if you convince yourself that you see a new signal, then it's very likely to be you know, dark matter or at least a, you know, some component of dark matter. At a collider, if you see a signal, you know you've produced a particle that lives at least on the time scale of your detector, but you don't know if it's cosmologically long-lived. So you found a, you know, interesting dark matter candidate, um, but you still have to convince yourself that what you actually see is long-lived on cosmological time scales. So it's sort of important, and this is an important point that I want to make, there's no single experiment that we can do that's going to cover all the possibilities. We really want to have a whole set of new experiments to explore the sub-GV range, direct detection and accelerator-based probes. And even within that, we want to have different types of techniques. So I think last week you heard very briefly introduction to direct detection, how it works. I'm just going to say um, a few similar things maybe again, hopefully again. And, but I'll focus on what the problem is with taking the traditional techniques to go and go low in mass. So the traditional way to do direct detection is it take, that you take the detector deep underground and you search for nuclear recoils from dark matter scattering of nuclei last year. Of course, that's not the only thing people have done or are doing. People are also looking for spin-dependent interaction where the dark matter doesn't scatter elastically of the coherency of the whole nucleus, but instead you couple to the spin, the dark matter spin couples to the spin of the nucleus. Okay, so those are also interesting searches, and the best result on that comes from PICO, uh, right, they released new results a few months ago, they have ideas to upgrade the experiments, go to a larger mass detector, and they can look for WIMPs that are spin-dependent interactions. So that's also very interesting direction to go experimentally, uh, but what we're interested here is to go to the sub-GV range, okay? Now, the, so the basic picture, that you've got some interaction that, you, that allows you to scatter of nuclei in your detector, the nucleus gets a recoil, and depending on the material, that recoiling nucleus can give you some scintillation light, it can give you some ionization signal, it might give you some heat, some phonons that you can measure. And, um, and you want to go deep underground because there's, of course, cosmic ray backgrounds, which might also interact in your detector and which can give you background signals, and you want to avoid those. So going low underground will reduce the muon flux that you get, for example, and uh, allows you, to, you know, to do a very sensitive search for rare events, rare events. So the nuclear recoil energy that you get from a dark matter scattering nucleus is given by the momentum transfer from the dark matter to the nucleus over twice the target mass, the nuclear mass. And the momentum transfer is bounded from above by two times, sorry, root, yeah, two times the reduced mass between the dark matter and the nucleus and the velocity of the dark matter so we put a square in there, and then what we get is this here. Okay, so momentum transfer is bounded from above. And now we can put some numbers into this, and what we get is that this is less than about 100 electron volts for a dark matter mass of 500 MeV. So I'm going to take the limit of light dark matter, 
you take the limit of light dark matter, dark matter much lighter than the nucleus, then this reduced mass just becomes a dark matter mass. So I've got an m chi squared there, and then there's a one over mn, one of the nuclear mass, and we can put in different nuclei. Silicon has a mass, the silicon nucleus has a mass of 28 GV roughly, so this is what I used in the estimate here. And what you have basically is a dark matter mass. Uh, for a 500 MeV dark matter mass, you can get a recall, nuclear recall energy of 100 EV for a 28 GV um, silicon nucleus. Okay. Now, what we've done in this estimate, we've assumed that V chi, the velocity of the dark matter, is the escape velocity plus the Earth velocity. So we've assumed the maximally possible velocity of the dark matter, right? So the dark matter can have an energy, a velocity not more than the escape velocity, and you might get a head-on collision of the Earth, the detector on your Earth, the nucleus on the Earth, and the dark matter particles, so the maximum velocity is this. And this is uh, about 544 kilometers per second plus 220 kilometers per second. And that's what I assumed here. That's for silicon. So the best threshold right now So I was preparing these lectures last week, and I wrote down the best thresholds that were around last week. And then on Monday, there was a new paper by Crest, which improved the threshold by an order of magnitude. So I had to change my notes, or add that at least. So um, the best thresholds So I'll just give you a few. So Crest, before Monday at least, had 300 EV. CDMS light as well. Lux, well, all the xenon experiments are roughly similar, about the KEV of that order. And the new Crest, about 20 EV. Uh, this use, these use different elements. So this crest limit comes from calcium tungstate. The CDMS light limit comes from silicon. The lux limit comes from xenon, of course. And the crest limit comes from sapphire. And this was one gram. So there's, I think, even less, a little bit less than a gram of a detector. So what you can see, with the exception of the last one here, which is a very small target mass, the big experiments like Lux or Xenon 1 ton or you know, LZ coming up, their threshold is about a KEV. And you can see that if you want to have a KEV, you just won't get to the dark matter mass, that the, you're know, far below a GEV. So maybe a few hundred MeV, but to really get to below 100 MeV to 10 MeV to MeV is difficult to do with nuclear recoils. And the problem is really is two things. So First of all, the amount of energy that's available in the dark matter that the dark matter could give to your nucleus is, of course, just bounded by the dark matter kinetic energy. Right, so the, the dark matter energy is a half m chi v squared, v chi squared. That's the maximum energy that you can imagine giving to your detector. And as you lower the dark matter mass, that decreases. But in addition, as you lower the dark matter mass below the target mass, what happens is that the fraction that, of energy that you can actually give to the nucleus decreases as well. The fraction decreases. So in the end, the scaling goes as the dark matter mass squared. And that just comes from momentum conservation. So you, do that, you can do that you know, on your own and check it. But basically, the, momentum, the requirement of momentum conservation and the fact that the kinetic energy decreases as m chi makes the recoil energy go as m chi squared. Okay, so you very, very quickly drop the recoil energy that you get as you lower the dark matter mass. <clears throat> so the best, so the limits, the way they look usually, so 
So the dark matter mass here, the best limit is roughly 10 to the minus 9 picobarn at 30 GeV, so from Xenon 1 ton recently. <coughs> Everything above here is excluded. This is the cross section to scatter of a nucleus, normalized to a nucleon. So since it's coherent, ignoring a form factor expression, so the scattering of the nucleus is just A squared times the scattering of the nucleon. And to compare different experiments that use different materials easily, everyone normalizes it to sigma n, sigma little n, so nucleon, and that's 10 to minus 9 picobarn, the best limit around 30 GeV. Um, and you had a few GeV, the experiments usually peter out, with a few exceptions. So the best limit at low masses or the lowest limit, uh, the lowest mass that's been constrained from nuclear recall searches so from nuclear recoil is from Crest, the latest result, and it's about, goes to 130 MeV. But the cross section is three times 10 to the five picobon. Okay, so that's 14 orders of magnitude weaker than the best limit here. So there's a limit that goes lower, but it's sitting way up here, okay. <clears throat> uh, just, uh, this must have been discussed last week, but the scaling here is very simple. So we, the rate of a dark matter particle hitting your detector is proportional to the number of dark matter particles that there are in the halo. We don't know what that is. What we do know is that that is given by the density, the energy density over the mass of the dark matter. And we know the density of the dark matter reasonably well, 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter over the dark matter mass. So as I increase the dark matter mass, I just linearly decrease the number of dark matter particles that there are in my halo, which means that for high masses, if you look at the first formula there, e, the recoil energy is less than 2 mu chi n v chi squared over mn. For large dark matter masses, that's a fixed number. Okay, it's just equal to twice the nuclear mass times the velocity of the dark matter squared. Um, so it doesn't matter that the mass of the target but well, the dark matter mass is, is, is not relevant anymore for the problem, but the only thing that is effective is the number of dark matter particles. So there's a linear, linearly decreasing limit. And then at low masses, there's of course a threshold. So this is, explains this, and here there's just a threshold. Okay, and what we wanna do is a probe in lower masses and also better sensitivities. And over the last few years, and I'll stop here and then we'll start with that tomorrow, over the last few years, several ideas have been developed to try and do that. And some of these ideas are now coming to fruition. These ideas have been largely driven by, experimental, by, by theorists. We're coming up with ideas and collaboration with experimentalists who are willing to think off the beaten path to try new things. And also experimentalists you know, who are developing amazing new technologies and sensitive detectors. And with that, you know, we have a real ability now to probe down to MeV masses in dark matter scattering. And there are ideas which require further R&D to probe even down to KeV masses. And tomorrow I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on. Thank you. <laughs>